right, so um, these lectures are about uh, recent joint work with um, Junju Kwan at MPH. And uh, Victor Gary, who just finished his PhD at Princeton. I uh, should mention them at the beginning. Um, they were my uh, very, very wonderful collaborators. And this is a series of lectures about the Thrion saga conjecture. So we should start um, with the Euler equations and the classical on saga conjecture. So set the stage. All right, so first thing in terms of oil equations. So I have two equations um, for the unknowns, which um, throughout this week will always be a velocity field um, whose domain is uh, some collection of times, times the uh, periodic three-dimensional torus, so always three dimensions. And the factor is defined similarly, but is a scalar function. And um, these, equ these equations model uh, ideal inviscid flow um, for fluid of constant density. And uh, when we start studying a PD like this, um, one of the first things we want to know is, are there um, conserved quantities? So in order to find uh, the main conserved quantity that we're interested in, um, we can write down a local energy identity for smooth solutions. And the local energy identity is obtained by taking the dot product of the first equation with u and using the divergence free condition. And what you get is uh, following identity. You get that this is equal to zero. And uh, if I integrate this in space, um, so integral over T3, I get that um, DDT of one half U L2 norm squared equals zero. And let's call this E of T. This is the kinetic energy. So the smooth solutions, the total kinetic energy is a, a constant function of time. But um, one thing about uh, the Euler equations is that um, this conservation law or this conserved quantity isn't enough to tell you that smooth solutions exist forever. So uh, smooth solutions in general only exist locally in time. And uh, this motivates our consideration, at least at the mathematical level, of weak solutions. So um, we need weak solutions U in L2 Tx um, defined by duality. And by duality, I mean testing against divergence free vector fields. which is why I didn't say anything about architecture. And uh, if I'm stuck with weak solutions in general, um, the question then is which weak solutions uh, are going to satisfy uh, this equality? So the question. Which weak solutions satisfy 
u prime of t equals zero. And this is the subject of um, Ansager's best conjecture. So Ansager conjecture. Um, I can play that. So his conjecture has um, two parts. There's a conservation half, which says that if I have a weak solution, which is um, uniformly in time, uh, holder continuous with alpha bigger than one third, then E prime of T is All right, so this says that uh, with this amount of regularity, at least, I can say that these solutions still satisfy um, this problem. And the other half of this conjecture um, says that, uh, so if alpha is less than one third, um, there exists weak solutions U with um, E prime of T, not equal to zero. Now, his actual conjecture said that, um, let's say actually, he conjectured that E prime of T ought to be less than zero. And the phrase he used was something like uh, dissipation without viscosity. So dissipation, without viscosity. But at the moment, I've just written down the PE, which is uh, time reversible. So if you, give me an if you give me a solution with decreasing kinetic energy, I can turn it around and give you one with increasing kinetic energy. But we'll actually motivate uh, this, this property in a bit. Um, and The other remark I want to make is that um, I'm focusing this week on the 3D Euler equations. So um, if I consider instead the uh, 2D Euler equations, um, I think the expectation is actually that maybe E prime of t equals zero. At least it's not, um, it's different than the 3D Euler equations. Um, uh, so let's say different in 2D. So we're just going to focus on, on 3D. And uh, Ansager's conjecture has um, uh, remarkably been proven as a theorem. Or let's call this, let's say, Ansager theorem. And um, so the first half. Um, was proven by Constantine T and TT um, following an earlier work of, of I -Ink. And what they showed is that um, E prime of T equals zero if U is in L3 T B alpha three infinity X. All right, so we're going to be using um, Dussoff space throughout this talk, so I should write down what the definition of that norm is. So F the alpha three infinity um, torus um, is the sum of, I guess I should say, alpha bigger than one third. So it's the sum of the L3 norm, <laughs> F L3. Plus the supremum over um, z greater than zero of one over z to the alpha. Um, so I translate my function by z. I subtract the original function, and I I have one over z to the alpha. So this is a difference quotient, which is weighted not by the the full power of z which would be a v13, but by, by this fraction, fractional difference, difference quotient. All right. So that's the first half. Z is a vector. 
Yes. Uh, thank you. All right. And yes, please interrupt me if I uh, write something silly or you have a question. All right. So the the second half of this conjecture um, was proven by um, Isaac in the case of um, e prime of t not equal to zero, and um, the case where e prime of t is less than zero was proven by Kristen Buckmaster, um, Mo Galalis, um, Laszlo. And glad we call. Um, so they covered the, the case of this. Now, uh, maybe let's go over here. Stupid question. Uh, so you wrote there at infinity or Historical accuracy. I think I mean, did it. Uh, yeah, I wrote. Uh, I wrote it in the way that uh, Cyber Formula did it. But um, as you're basically pointed out, the confirmation actually only requires L3 and time with the specified All right. So this is uh, this is on Cyber's theorem, but. Um, the question still remains, um, what happened to the local energy identity with L4 smooth solutions? So it has to be viol violated somehow if, if uh, this theorem is to hold. But the question is, how exactly is it violated? So what happened to local energy Identity. And uh, if I have a solute weak solution, which is an L3TX, then I get that P is an L3 halves TX. And I can simply say that this quantity down here might not be a well defined function, but it is a distribution because I can pass the derivatives off. And uh, let's just give this distribution the name. So we'll call it minus D U. So this is a space time distribution. And uh, uh, the relevant question um, for the strong on cyber conjecture is, um, do I have some control over this dissipation measure? Um, so can I control D of U? For example, is it sign? And uh, the constructions of Isaac and Buckmaster, Delalis, Shiklahidi, and McCall, uh, this object is well defined because I have solutions which are C alpha or alpha less than one third, and so I can pass the derivatives off. But um, in those constructions, uh, I'll abbreviate the foreign age, but just, uh, just this acronym, acronym Buckmaster, Galavis, Shekhalidi, Junior, and Paul. Um, <laughs> uh, so, the view is not signed. And in general, these constructions uh, don't give a control on the uh, view. And the strong on Sagar conjecture then is. Uh, as follows. That's the way the paper is saved in my list of uh, Dropbox of papers. So <laughs> EDLSJB just rolls off the tongue for me.
All right, so strong outside of conjecture. And I'm going to phrase it in the uh, L3 scale of function spaces. So we're going to have two parts. Um, the first is um, rigidity part. And it says that if U is in this function space for alpha greater than one third, then uh, this distribution, uh, D of U, is equal to zero. And uh, this was proven by Duchamp and Robert, who also gave a very nice formula for D of U. So the real work in the proof is deriving a formula for D of U. And I'll write down this nice formula later in the talk, but just for the moment, let's just call this distribution, whatever it is. Uh, and uh, the second half of this conjecture says that if alpha is less than one third, then there exists weak solutions U, uh, which are continuous in time with values in the alpha to infinity. Um, and these weak solutions satisfy uh, D of U is greater than or equal to zero. So I have a sign on this additional error measure, which, tell it, which tells me that I'm dissipating energy not only upon integration over the whole forest, but over every uh, subdomain of space and time. And P prime of T is negative. So I'm dissipating the kinetic energy, and um, I have this sign condition on the additional. And this is the theorem that um, I uh, proved with um, uh, Vikram and theory. On. You have a lower bound in the B? Uh, yeah, so for us, we um, B of U is some smooth function that, that we specify. Okay. We didn't bother to check if you can provide any smooth function. But uh, we at least uh, gave some examples of some positive functions for which you have a weak solution. All right. So uh, this is the strong outsider conjecture. And the goal for today is um, uh, to motivate uh, this conjecture and preview um, a bit of, of the rest of the week. But uh, also, if we have time today, we'll prove the E to gap, uh, which is the same. So, any questions so far? Background. Uh, our solutions are absolutely not C alpha. So what they actually are is um, uh, um, C zero T E uh, sorry L one over one minus three. So as alpha goes to one third. Um, the denominator goes to zero, and so our solutions are not quite bounded, but almost. 
but it's conceivable that C alpha would also yeah. exist, right? I see no reason to conjecture that it isn't true. But that would be the very strong one side of conjecture. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will uh, show you tomorrow that uh, there do seem to be fundamental obstructions to reaching one third of C. Okay. Which is why I'm working in L3 to begin with. And shifting to time smoothness through equation is, is it happening or not? It's it's directly from the construction. So we're not really introducing any irregularities in time. But if you have a solution where it's uh, just n e in time and in this place of space in space, does do you not get better regularity in time from the equation? Uh, uh, that's a good question. I don't know about better regularity for you off the top of my head. I do know you get uh, regularity for the kinetic energy of some kind. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, from Hölder, you get not just an infinity. It's automatically Hölder. If, if, if it's C alpha in space, it's ah, actually C alpha in time. Yes, yes. Uh, good point. So I didn't, I didn't bother to check if we get any better regularity. I don't know. All right. Uh, so let's discuss uh, a bit of the math. More of this. So the first thing I want to do is motivate this condition that uh, these two conditions. And in order to uh, motivate uh, those conditions, I need to write down the number of your and values. So, VP plus divergence really depends from the middle. Plus red and new. And the difference in, in the Navier Stokes equation is, of course, uh, that I've added this Laplacian term where uh, nu is positive. And I still have the divergence. Is there a question? Maybe not. All right, and at least formally. Um, uh, Matt, the request is for you to write a little bigger. Ah, yeah, I'll, yeah. Thanks for asking, I'll, I'll do my best. All right, so formally, um, as new goes to zero, you might expect that we uh, recover Euler out of, out of non your strokes. All right, but what can we say about um, solutions of Navier Stokes? So there is a class of solutions called suitable solutions. And uh, these are solutions for which um, U is L infinity T um, L2 X, and also L2 T H dot one X. And uh, the solutions satisfy in addition uh, a local energy inequality. So, dt one half mu nu squared plus divergence u nu one half mu squared plus u nu minus mu minus mu squared over u um, plus mu gradient mu squared over two is less than or equal to zero. All right, so these are the uh, suitable solutions um, studied by uh, Caffarelli, Cohn, and Yaren Bird. And uh, the suitability condition gives you some control on how a blow up may occur. But uh, what I'm more interested in is uh, 
what happens if I take the limit as nu goes to zero of suitable solutions? So let's say that. Um, if I have convergence of u nu in L3PX uh, to some function u, um, which then is called Euler, um, I actually know that uh, the, the shown Robert measure for the Euler solution u is um, non negative. And this is inherited from um, local energy inequality. The assumption that I have that this is negative lets me um, pass to the limit and find on the right hand side. Um, uh, we're just showing our bare measure, which then has to be constant. Matt, your brother says it could be a little bigger. Ah, uh, this next <laughs> but a little bigger still. Okay, it's maybe actually getting smaller. Yeah, I think I already <laughs> forgot your uh, admonition once, so I'll probably forget. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, this motivates then uh, the study of not just any weak solutions of Euler, but ones which uh, dissipate the energy. Um, and we could say even maybe. That a dream theorem. All right, here it is. <laughs> the dream theorem would be to construct um, you knew, um, maybe smooth or even suitable converging to an Euler solution. And while there's been some uh, progress on this question, if I add forcing, I'm considering just uh, the unforced equations this week, and uh, this question is widely open. All right. All right, so uh, this is not your Stokes. And if we uh, go back to talking about Euler, um, there's a very nice history of uh, constructions of various uh, weak or dissipative solutions. So these start with constructions of Sheffer and Schneerman. And uh, uh, so these give non conservative solutions. But uh, these constructions don't give any regularity. So, uh, not Bessov, not Holder. Uh, and uh, the first construction, uh, which was putting in the direction of regularity, was due to um, uh, Milo and Lanatimo. And I think it's 2009, although you may have thought better than me. But uh, this construction gave um, solutions which were bounded in space and time uh, via so called convex integration methods. And uh, shortly after their construction of, of bounded weak solutions, um, they gave uh, the first construction of holder continuous solutions. So shortly thereafter, we will only as well see alpha dx solutions or alpha less than one x. And uh, this, this work followed a 
somewhat different approach than the earlier work. So this is via uh, more of a Nash iteration type approach. And uh, this, um, this work really served as the jumping off point for a sequence of papers, which successively raised uh, the exponent by bit by bit until um, uh, the proof Proofs of Izet and uh Master Dalal, Shekelhidi, and Bacall, all the way up to Alfred Kirkpatrick. All right, so, um, so these constructions were uh, producing older continuous solutions, but there's a different flavor of um, comics integration or Nash iteration, if you want to call it, which can be called. Uh, intermittent convex integration, let's say. And for me, uh, intermittent means that uh, if I have a function just defined in space and I take the L infinity norm and I divide by um, the L2 norm, then this is much larger than that. If I have a function uh, which uh, I know is bounded, then this, this isn't going to be the case. The L infinity norm and the L2 norm will be this size. So you can think of this as um, a function which has a very thin but sharp peak. This would be an example of uh, something which is intermittent. And uh, you can contrast that with something which could be called homogeneous, and that would look just like that. And can you tell us, please, uh, what is the weak strong uniqueness class for the Euler equation? So if we have for some initial data, for example, smooth solution, then it comes, and if we have the uh, dissipative solution, weak dissipative solution for the same initial data, uh, they do coincide? Yes. But what is the class for dissipation solution? Uh, what is the regularity? Is it L L infinity or L3? Uh, I, I want to say L infinity, but can someone? For the weak one, for the weak one. Yeah, for the weak one. Okay. L2? Yeah. Yeah. Wait, for weak, strong, unique, you're asking? No. The, the strong solution has, it has to be in Yeah. But the weak solution is just L2. Uh, but in time. What what is the they do is to have sort of energy. So in time and infinity. And infinity or will okay, and it's okay. It means mm -hmm. All right. So this intermittent style comics integration produces some different theorems. And the first one I want to mention, which sort of initiated this whole intermittent. Uh, style is due to Tristan McMaster and Vina McCall. And what they constructed were um, C0 P H alpha X solutions of um, 3D Navier Stokes, where alpha is very small, but it is positive. And um, there's many papers which construct uh, solutions of various equations which are intermittent, but I just want to focus now on the instructions for Euler. And um, the next one I want to mention is due to Kristen again, Mavera um, Masmudi, myself, and Vlad the call. And what we constructed were C0 T H alpha X solutions of 3D Euler, where alpha could be taken up to one half. All right. But these solutions that we constructed um, had very low spatial integrability, maybe only L4 or something. And um, so, uh, 
the theorem that I proved with Vlad a year later um, added um, so C0 T H alpha X. And in addition to H alpha X, we had L1 over 1 minus 2. All right, and the significance of um, these two function spaces is um, that they embed in the one third minus three infinity. I'll just write one third minus as a shorthand for you give me some alpha left in one third, and I can give you a solution of the alpha. And uh, this then, in some sense, gives you what could be called uh, an intermittent onsider theory. In the sense that we achieve almost the sharp L3 based um, regularity that you could expect, but none of the holder regularity was characterized. Um, you know, the solutions of the original outsider. And uh, the, the papers that I recently wrote with uh, Kim Jun and Vikram, so uh, the first paper was um, we improved this result of NB. Uh, using a rather different method of proof, which um, uh, I might uh, describe rather colloquially as a, let's say, L3 sort of wavelet inspired proof. And the new proof is, is somewhat interesting, but our main motivation in writing this down was that it developed the tools that we need in order to prove this wrong answer conjecture. So, strong answer conjecture. All right, so what I'm going to be uh, presenting this week is portions of both of these papers um, enough uh, hopefully, to give you an idea of how to prove this strong outsider projection. All right. So, I aiming for an hour. Um, so, I guess, I guess 20 minutes left if that sounds good. Yeah. All right, perfect. Um, so, uh, let's switch gears a little bit and discuss um, some of the physics motivation behind behind these constructions. So the physics discussion starts with Coleman Morov's 1941 um, phenomenological theory of turbulence. And the undergirding assumption of, of his theory is that if I take the limit as it goes to zero of minus one half DDT of, uh, of the L2 norm, um, let's call this epsilon nu. I get some number in the limit, um, epsilon, which is greater than zero. Um, so there's a similar confire to a certain that. We have uh, in the limit, uh, we expect dissipation even in the absence of viscosity. And this is saying that if I compute the dissipation rate as a function of the viscosity, I get something which does not vanish. And uh, armed with this assumption and um, some symmetry assumptions. So, um, translation, rotation. Uh, Kolmogorov uh, made some predictions for um, structure function 
x minus. But let me write down how uh, the structure function is. So s nu p is out. So integrate e to m. Integrate over uh, unit vectors in the two-dimensional one sphere. And then average over this for us. So z hat dot u nu t x plus um, l c hat um, minus u nu x uh, p and the the x these we have the right, so what is this measuring? It's measuring a velocity increment in the direction uh, z hat of magnitude L, let's say zero one. And then I average over all the possible directions after taking the dot product with uh, the direction of, of the increment. And uh, what K41 predicts is that, um, Says that S nu P of L scales like epsilon nu L to the P on C. And what I mean by this squiggly is that if I take the limit uh, first as nu goes to zero, and then the limit as the length scale goes to zero, uh, I see this scaling uh, as Now, if you stare at this thing, um, it's rather suggestive of Bessov regularity. So, um, the reason, of course, being that I'm measuring some velocity increments and trying to pull out a scaling with respect to the size of the increment. Let's say, that this is suggestive of um, solutions which belong uniformly to LPT B one third and X, um, which is like saying L infinity T C one third X. All right, so it's absolutely not an accident that this one third exponent pops up in um, Kolmogorov's um, phenomenological theory and on Sager's on Sager's conjecture. Um, if I have time to write down the Duchamp Robert um, computation at the end of today, we'll basically see where the one third comes from. All right, but the last thing I want to say about the physics is. Um, on the topic of intermediacy. And um, what the physicists, I think, would generally describe intermediacy as is uh, deviations from K41 scaling. Meaning that if I plot uh, uh, the structure function exponents, um, let's say zeta p. So, so this is one value of zeta p. This is zeta p equals p on a three. That pull the up. Uh, intermittency says that I see something. Which is <laughs> this. Um, so this would be intermittent. And the point of intersection of, of these two curves is always um, e equals three, meaning that uh, the scaling of the third order structure function, which should be epsilon L to the first power, um, it's consistently observed in experiments and numerics to coincide with Kolmogorov scaling. All right, and uh, 
this is partially then why I feel justified in um, referring to our uh, theorem as a proof of the strong Onsager conjecture, or more accurately, the strong L3 Onsager conjecture, because L3 is, in a sense, um, perhaps the most natural space um, in which to measure um, these velocity increments and see the one third exponent popping out. All right. All right, so, um, so what's the plan for the rest of the week? Um, right. So the plan is to present um, parts of um, um, GKN uh, 23A and GKN 23B. And uh, it's a good thing I have uh, five days, or maybe it's a bad thing you, you, you'll be the judge, uh, because these papers are uh, admittedly rather long. Um, but what I want to convince you of is that uh, there's a, a set of ideas which governs the many computations uh, in, in these papers. And if you understand how those ideas work, then, okay, yes, you have to apply them many times, but it's sort of the same principle every time. Um, so let's say present any ideas from um, these, these two papers. And the basic strategy, um, is that we'll construct these solutions U as a limit as Q goes to infinity of what you could call subsolution. I don't know why I put the Q in the exponent. Um, and if limit should hold in the um, B one third minus infinity topology. And uh, these UQs. Solve uh, a set of relaxed equations. So I'll write down these relaxations next time, but they satisfy some relaxation of the Euler equations and a relaxation of the local energy inequality. And when I pass to the limit, I get an honest to God solution of the Euler equations with local energy inequality as well. And so um, the first thing I want to explain is why L3. And uh, as I uh, mentioned earlier uh, today, the basic reason is that um, C alpha appears limited um, to alpha less than one step. And making estimates in L3 is uh, part of what uh, makes these papers long. It's much harder than making estimates in L infinity, but I'm only working in L3 because I really don't know how to do it in C alpha. So that's the first thing I, I want to explain. And uh, following up on that is uh, this idea of a wavelet iteration. And what I mean by that is um, we will propagate assumptions, not just on the frequencies of these UQs, but uh, the space-time support as well. So we need knowledge on frequency and Space time. And this is uh, um, uh, this is a new idea in, in, in mass iterations for these equations. Usually uh, frequency information is enough. But uh, part of what I'll explain is that once you decide to work in L3, it really appears that you're forced um, to have an iteration which carries some knowledge of, of space-time support. 
So you're forced to work in L3 as far as I can tell, and you're forced to use a wave limit iteration as, as far as I can tell. Um, and uh, on Thursday, we'll um, build some of the tools which will uh, help us close this iteration. So, tools and example estimates. So, I promise I won't do estimates just for estimates' sake. I'll, I'll uh, try and explain the idea behind uh, what we're doing. And the last thing I want to explain. Um, is what we call the intermittent pressure. Meaning that uh, we have to construct um, uh, rather carefully uh, the pressure that appears in our solutions. Uh, Right. And uh, I'm not really sure how to explain why this is the case, other than to say, um, if you look at the equations uh, or the relaxed local energy identity, there aren't that many terms appearing in there. And so if you want to make it less than or equal to zero, um, maybe you have to be careful with the pressure. But um, this is also uh, rather different from um, most of the, uh, or at least all of the iterations for fluid equations that I'm aware of. With. Usually you use that the pressure solves uh, an elliptic equation, which is derived from the Euler equations themselves. And, uh, or if you're working in a Nash iteration, um, the pressure is sort of the easy to treat term um, that takes you a couple paragraphs and you don't think about it again. But uh, that's the last thing is the situation pressure. All right, so um, maybe I won't have time to do the proof, but I guess the last thing I want to do is at least write down um, um, the theorem of Duchamp and Bear, and maybe give you a hint as to how to do the proof for them. The proof can be a uh, first mm -hmm. exercise, I guess. Mm -hmm. All right. So the starting point there is any L3 space-time solution or dissipative? Good question. So, so assume um, U in L3 X is just any distributional solution. So then what uh, Duchamp and Robert say is that uh, this thing here is equal to minus um, d of u, and d of u has a nice form. So it's the limit as epsilon goes to zero of the integral over the torus of the gradient of a mollifier at length scale epsilon um, dotted into a velocity increment. So let's put an argument inside this function. Dotted into a velocity increment. And then multiply by the square of the modulus of the velocity increment or difference closure. And then I realized I started writing small again, so uh, maybe we'll uh, write it over there. Um, all right, but where is this? Um, maybe in just the last couple minutes, I'll say where this comes from. This comes from the fact that uh, when I try and derive some kind of uh, energy balance, I'm not allowed to just test with u um, because u uh, is not regular enough to, to act as a test function. So I have to mollify. 
And that's why the mollifier appears. And uh, I try and pass the gradient onto the mollifier then. And uh, mollification and multiplication don't commute. So the term where the mollification is going to spit out something non-trivial is, is when u is dotted into the quadratic term. And so that's why the thing in here is cubic in velocity increments. It's because it's really the nonlinearity which is uh, contributing to this dissipation, uh, this dissipation measure. And uh, you can see um, from this formula basically where the Bessov regularity is used to show that this is zero because um, so I picked the time and I assume that this is in the alpha ring infinity or alpha greater than one third then um, the U is the limit as epsilon goes to zero of um, from here, the mollifier with the gradient on it, I see epsilon inverse. Um, and uh, each of these difference quotients spits out epsilon to the alpha of L3. From U and Alpha the Alpha three, and uh, this is of course zero as epsilon goes to zero. All right, so um, I don't have time to do the proof, um, and maybe we'll skip that and pick up with uh, with the other half of this conjecture tomorrow. All right, thanks, thanks for your attention.